Hi, my name is Rhonda Robbins. I am a success strategies coach, a personality trainer, certified life coach and NLP practitioner, and I'm here today to give you a brief presentation, and I mean very brief actually, kind of more like just an overview of personality typology. The first thing I want to really stress is that this is not a way to put people in boxes or to categorize them. It is more than that. It is an opportunity for us to take a look at ourselves and to take a look at other people and to develop a better understanding and a better relatedness, to get into rapport with people in ways that we have only imagined and not been able to achieve yet. So that's the entire intent and purpose of this is to improve our life, not to point at somebody else and say, I'm better than you and you do this and you don't do that and you're in this box and that kind of thing. Today we're going to talk about our differences and how our differences serve us. One of the very basic premises of personality theory and study and training is to really get that I am nothing like you and you are nothing like me. We are different. I'm here today to encourage you to celebrate those differences, not to fight against them and try to change other people to stop thinking that everyone should be just like you because you've got it all figured out and you've got it going on and your life is perfect and your life is good and why can't this other person get their life more in control and be more scheduled and be more regulated be more like you diversity is really good diversity is what makes our life interesting because we each have a way of being that comes naturally to us it is who we are at our very very core we are each very unique. One personality type is not better than another, and we are equally important and worthwhile. Unfortunately, sometimes others try to remake us in their image, and I believe that that's where a lot of our problems come in. We're generally attracted to the opposite personality because their strengths are our weaknesses and vice versa. We complement and fill each other out because of that. But while we're attracted to the opposite personality because of their strengths, we're also attracted to someone on the same level of emotional pain as ourselves. What I mean by that is whatever kind of dysfunction or emotional pain level you have, you're projecting that it'll resonate with somebody who's experiencing the same level of dysfunction or the same kind of emotional pain, and that's who you'll attract to you. For myself, for years, I kept wondering why I was attracting all of these frankly really creepy people, really needy people, very insecure and unstable people. <laughs> All I needed to do was look in the mirror because it was me I was attracting. and It was pretty scary, so I put a stop to that. While we are attracted to the opposite personality's strengths, once we're in the relationship with them, we live with their weaknesses. This frankly frustrates and annoys us which is why we try to change them instead of celebrating our differences. My personal introduction to personality theory came to me at a time when I was having a very tough time in my marriage and the counselor had us take evaluations as part of our session work. At the time, because of my personality, my personality is that of a star, a sanguine, and I thought it was very fun and interesting. As soon as we were through with our coaching and counseling sessions, I immediately just forgot it. I didn't even apply it. I, I didn't even see the real application value of it until years later. So what exactly is personality? Personality is the distinguishing combination of behavior, emotions, mental traits, and character traits that we are born with. These are DNA driven. Personality is your manner of thinking, behaving, and reacting. We are born with these traits. These traits are the real you. The origin of personality theory dates all the way back to approximately 370 BC. Over 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates is credited with being the father of personality theory. You may know him better as the father of medicine or for the Hippocratic Oath. As he observed all of the people, he noticed that there were different kinds of people, that there were different patterns that people exhibited in their behavior. And he thought that this was coming from the chemicals and fluids in the body. He decided that sanguines had red hot blood coursing through their veins and that this is what made them have high energy, fun-loving, be outgoing, the people who can't sit still. 
He looked at the cholerics. He decided that they had yellow bile. That made them short-tempered and bossy, like a baby with choleric or an adult with cholera. The melancholies, he decided that they had black bile, black or dark blood, and that they had a tendency toward depression and moodiness. The phlegmatics, he decided they had thick blood that made them slow and lethargic due to this thick blood. And you'll notice that he made that determination in 370 BC. In 190 AD, Galen, the Greek doctor, took his personality model that he had created with the four humors, and he started assigning characteristics to it. From 190 AD until the early 1900s, that was the prevailing school of thought, was that we're born a certain way, we have certain characteristics and qualities. Enter Sigmund Freud. In 1900 through 1909 A.D., Sigmund Freud postulated that human behavior is based on the environment, not on how we're born, and thus began the raging debate between nature versus nurture. In 1920, Carl Jung, a Swiss physician, disagreed with the prevailing theory at the time, which of course was, it's all in how you're nurtured, and it has nothing to do with nature, how you're born. Carl Jung publishes a book called Psychological Types, which is later the basis for the Myers-Briggs Indicator, which came out in the 1950s. 1926, Dr. William Moulton Marston publishes The Emotions of Normal People, which becomes the basis for the DISC system. 1962, Uli Hallesby, a Norwegian theologian, publishes Temperament and the Christian Faith. Also in 1962, Myers-Briggs publishes the book The Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. 1962 also sees that the Japanese are becoming interested in the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. In 1966, Tim LaHaye publishes The Spirit-Controlled Temperament. Then you have The Cardiologist in 1974. 1978, you have Seen Delaney Corporate Training. 1980, Relationship Strategies. You've got The Merrill Reed, 1981. That was a very popular one. 1988, you've got Robert Bramson, Corporate Training, Naomi Breschner, The Blood Types in 1988. 1983, Florence Litauer publishes Personality Plus. Florence Litauer is the person I would consider to be my mentor. David Kiersey and Marilyn Bates published the Please Understand Me, which is the same type of indicator as the Myers-Briggs. It's called the Kiersey Sorter. 1997, Taylor Hartman publishes The Color Code. 1988, Diane Turner publishes The Personality Compass. So you can see that there is a variety, and there's hundreds more different models than just these. The two that were instrumental for me, and I would consider them to be the mentors that have brought me to the point of understanding and training of where I am, were the Personality Plus and the Color Code. And you can see that it, this is just a few of them. You've got, you know, you've got uh, Personality Dynamics, and they're calling them Expressive, Self-Reliant, Loyal, Factual, instead of Sanguine, Choleric, Phlegmatic, Melancholy. You've got the True Colors, calling them Orange, Green, Blue, Gold. You've got the um, Herbo Psychiatrists, they call them they give them the name of spices. They've got pepper, garlic, parsley, ginger. So even no matter what label you put on these, there's still the four personality model. Here's an example of what the Myers-Briggs looks like. It's a 16-quadrant model, which for me I find it's just much more than I need. I kind of feel like it's a little bit of overkill. I just want to keep it really simple. So the history of personality profiling, Florence Litauer says, unmistakably, we are born with these personalities. We do not learn them. The University of Minnesota did a study of 358 sets of twins, and of the 358, there were 44 sets of identical twins, meaning they have the same genetic pattern. When these 44 sets of twins were tested, their personality tests came out almost identical. When laid side by side, you would have thought the same person took the test twice, instead of two separate people. And of course, there are many other articles on the subject that have been printed, including How We Become Who We Are by the Atlanta Monthly, Twins by the New Yorker, and there was a story on heredity in the U.S. News, just to mention a few of them. I think it would be important at this point to tell you that there's been a resurgence back into the 
we are born this way. And as they continue to do more and more of these studies, the studies on twins and so forth, it seems to refute the, if you're nurtured a certain way, then that's exactly how your personality is formed. So the, the trend was that Hippocrates started it, everybody believed it, 1900s came out the nurture versus nature, everybody believed that for a while, and the trend now is back toward we're born a certain way. And I absolutely believe that because I look around me and I see children and I see that they are born completely different right straight out of the womb. They haven't learned anything yet, they can't talk yet, they've got the same parents, they live in the same house and the same time in the family history, and they are completely different individuals. So what we have here on this chart is how we become who we are. And here we are, we're born a little baby. We have these core motivation and inborn traits, which an inherent temperament, if you will. As we go through our life, we are impacted by our gender and our nurturing. The other filters we pass through are birth order, education, experience, character, morals, culture, society, spiritual, religious views, feelings, attitudes, beliefs. So here we are, I'm coming this way, you're coming this way, we meet in the middle and we see one another, and now we've had all these different filters, we still have our core essence of who we are in our personality and temperament. We meet one another and we, we try to decide if we're right for one another. So we take our basic personality, pass it through all of these filters which alter it and change it, and there we are. The question really becomes, who's the real me and who's the learned me? If you, for instance, take this woman, when she was born, she was very much a director. She was the kind of take charge, kind of just do things, get it done kind of person. She's naturally strong and decisive, a mover, a shaker, jumps over tall buildings in a single bound. But she was born to a producer set of parents very perfectionistic everything had to be done a certain way and producers are much more reserved they're much more pulled back and so because they're both perfectionistic and reserved and fairly quiet non-obtrusive people they've got this girl and she's just like crazy she's going here doing this demanding this kind of in your face here. They rein her back in and they tell her that's not acceptable, you can't do that. They start changing who she is and what her core motivations in life are. And in order to feel the love and acceptance of the parents, she complies. But what happens is as she complies as a child to just acquiescing and to not being who she truly is, she learns a pattern of behavior which she continues to bring with her further into life, which actually doesn't serve her because she's always in conflict with herself. She wants to do the things that are in her core essence, in her core being, but she, she feels like she can't. She feels guilty if she does them. And so as a result of that, you have a depressed individual who feels very disempowered, even about their own body. I believe we have a large percentage of the population feeling disempowered and depressed as a result of not being able to be who they are. I personally reconnected to the power of personality theory in the early 2000s and formed my company Personality Connection in 2002. As the basis for my personality labels, I thought about the fact that we are players on a stage. Each one of us has a different role to play. You've got the director who's directing the whole thing, saying, this is what I want, the lights, the acting. I've got all this stuff going on. You've got the stars who are out there performing. You've got the people behind the scenes who are back there making sure the lights and the curtains come in at the right times, making sure that the stairs and the props and everything are there. And then you have the people in the audience who are sitting there just to enjoy it. And so for me, I believe that these labels really make a difference when you think about them.